cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Well, welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters, and today on the show, I'm already laughing. This is already a good sign. I have Saul Orwell from sjo.com. He's a serial entrepreneur and amazing and has made me laugh because apparently he's an old curmudgeon. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. <laughs> First of all, it's not apparent I am most definitely an old curmudgeon. With that said, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. So you are amazing. I will tell everybody that. So that way you have a lot of pressure before we start this. But, all right. we'll but you're, we'll you're a best. serial entrepreneur. So sort of uh, go as quick as you can over how awesome the businesses that you've had are. So that way we understand your credibility. Because you're one of those guys that talk business because you've done business. Yes. Um, so just one thing I wanted to know before. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I was always about being free, uh, having my freedom, um, and entrepreneurship was basically my avenue to do that. And the way I got into entrepreneurship was I was solving my own problems. Like this is a common refrain, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially when they're starting, they kind of uh, misplace that. Um, so to get into the business I did, originally uh, I immigrated here in 1997. I was incredibly shy, incredibly out of place. Like I grew up in Saudi Arabia and Japan. The, the U.S., especially because I came into Houston, it just everything, everything blew my mind. And so online games were my refuge. That's where I gravitated towards. And so my first successful business was in virtual currency in these online games. So if we played World of Warcraft, EverQuest, these were the kind of games I got involved in. Um, and I realized there was an uh, you know opportunity there. I realized it was too slow, and that's how I got into that. At our peak, uh, I mean, we were doing a couple hundred thousand visitors a day. We we even bought out like the short form domain names for all these games. So like Matrix Online, we had MXO.com. We actually owned Diablo2.com because Blizzard had a, a trademark on II, but not the actual two. Um, so that was the initial big one. Uh, subsequently, I moved into a new neighborhood in Toronto. Um, and it was the first condo that had been built there and it was still under construction actually when I moved in or, you know, they're still finishing it out. And this is like 2003 or four. And this is before Google maps exist or right when it came out, Yelp was just brand new and I had no clue what the businesses were in my neighborhood. So I actually went out, take, took, you know, old school, uh, digital camera, took a picture of every business in my neighborhood and uploaded it into a website online. Um, and I remember we had 69 businesses, 75 pictures, and like 300 tags or something. Uh, that started blowing up, and that's how I got into local search. So the guys from Yelp and all that, like I dealt with them way, way, way back then. Subsequently, they were both doing well, and the reason I mentioned the freedom part was uh, I essentially retired. So I lived in the States, I lived in Argentina, I gave control to my number two and told him to run it, paid him better than I paid myself, because I had what I wanted, freedom. Um, and it's, you know, it sounds great just did a nomad life, especially back in the day, but it kind of sucks because I think, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you have that mindset that you want to build something and you want to create something. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually look back at those years with, uh, not, not like in a good way, more just like a wasted opportunity, um, that like, I'm glad I did it because it, it formed who I am, but I missed out on a lot of things. How old were you? Uh, and then, what's that? How old were you? Uh, I was like in my mid twenties at this age. So really? it was like two thousand five to like two thousand nine. So I was like twenty three to twenty seven, eight. And you think uh, you missed out? Interesting. Okay, because most people are like, that's the time that you do that stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's the there's the time, but I would say there's a time of like a year to do it, not five years, uh -huh. right? There's there's definitely you should go and explore and appreciate stuff. I mean, it, we got really into it. Like I used to be religious, so it's not like I was doing anything debaucherous. I was just being a, a nerd. I was always a nerd. I'm even more of a nerd. But uh, moving on, we're gonna ignore this part. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm a geek. I would I want to stay there forever, but my people don't, <laughs> so therefore I won't. <laughs> well, I have crazy nerd even stories of the internet. Anywho, uh, in 2009, I. Came came back to Toronto. I gained a lot of weight. Um, I lost a significant amount of weight. Uh, to put in my one little random brag, uh, I was just in the latest issue of People Magazine. I'm one of the before afters in it, which is hilarious. But uh, I realized that, hey, the supplement companies were ripping us off, that they were misrepresenting science. So like if you hear something, uh, glutamine, for example, sold as it will increase muscle mass by 300%. If you think about it, 300% is a lot of mass. Um, and so with another guy, I created a company called examine.com. We basically looked at the scientific research around supplements and now nutrition. So we're almost seven years old. We have over two and a half million visitors a month. Uh, we've been in every single mainstream magazine, newspaper you can imagine. 
Um, I've somehow uh, used that to become a digital advisor to a certain Mr. Arnold Schwarzenegger, which has been very interesting. Um, and so those are my three businesses. And so about a few years ago, uh, sorry, this is like a very long intro. Uh, through random happenstance, I got into Forbes. I don't, uh, Tim Ferriss shared it, said this man is living the four-hour work week. I had an influx of people asking me to mentor them or help them. I don't do any coaching. I don't do any consulting, no client work. But I realized most people teaching entrepreneurship have never really gone through it because most entrepreneurs are busy. Um, and so I started talking about entrepreneurship and productivity and kind of how I make it work. And here we are. I wish I was timing that intro. That would have been great. <laughs> so so I, I so appreciate all of this, though, because it tells us, A, what sucked and was good, but also, yeah. B, you actually know your stuff. I was going to swear, but your stuff. Yeah. I've, experienced, I've experienced it. Yeah, so, so good. So this is perfect segue because this is what I want to talk about. I want sort of the 80-20, and I know this is what everybody talks about, but I want yours because I feel like, no offense, everybody talks about 80-20 or, or the best of the best priority-wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they haven't lived it. They're like, oh, I read well, on Tim Ferriss's thing that we should do it like right. this. And 100%. in my head, I'm like, that's dumb. You shouldn't be doing those things. So what are some of those hacks that actually work in business, whether it be productivity or networking or whatever? Sure. So uh, disclaimer, one of my favorite phrases is only hacks use hacks. So I, I need to throw <laughs> that out before I get yes. into it. Um, I love that. The honest truth is, honestly, it goes back to the basic problem of what problem are you solving? Um, I see a lot of people call themselves entrepreneurs, but they're freelancers, let's say consultants. That's fine. There's like nothing wrong with it, but you need to have a central problem to solve. Secondly, I think people try to go too large. You look at examine.com today. We've got a team of like 20, you know, like I said, we're in pretty much every magazine or every week, something comes out that, you know, one of our guys is quoted and, and you look and you're like, whoa, these guys are huge. But when we started, we were only bodybuilding supplements. We had like five or seven supplements we covered. Right. Then we expanded into fitness supplements, then into health supplements, then into all supplements, then into nutrition and so forth and so forth. So the biggest thing I always tell people is like solve a very, very specific niche, solve that problem and then you can expand. Um, and people are always like, oh, I don't know how big my niche is. And I always say, listen, if there is a market for anime dragon porn on the Internet, there is a market for whatever problem it is you are solving. So going back to the 80-20, honestly, that's my biggest thing. And stemming from that is, you know, if you're solving a problem, you got to talk to people on the phone. Um, you got to ask the people what the, uh, what problem they need to solve. Uh, my buddy John Romanello, he had this great quote that says, I never said he licked my face. So if you were to read that in an email, you'd be like, okay, that's fine. But depending on the words you emphasize, right? If I said, I never said he licked my face versus I never said he licked my face, obviously someone licked your face versus it was something else that got licked. And that's why it's really important to have this conversation with your customers because they'll tell you the language, they'll tell you what's actually frustrating them. And then when you solve it, you just like knock it out of the park. Um, as a real life example, I've done multiple sale pa sales pages, obviously for different products. And the more attention we've, and one of our like uh, uh, metrics of how good our sales page is, is the questions we get on live chat that have any kind of correspondence to what's on the sales page. And we found that the better job we've done listing the customers, the tighter our sales page gets, and the less questions we get from our customers, they go in straight by. So uh, if it was, again, 80-20, I'd say, like, talk to the customers, figure out the actual problem, and solve a very, very, very specific problem. Like, if someone's saying, hey, I've got feet pain, don't solve for feet pain, solve for... Maybe it's overweight people. Maybe it's uh, specifically runners. Maybe it's cold weather runners who need a very specific kind of solution to uh, fix their feet. So that would be my uh, approach to okay. getting into anything new. So many deep diving questions into those two things, right? Uh, so talking on the phone, I mm -hmm. highly recommend it also. Most people hate it to the nth degree. It sucks. Like I'll admit, it sucks. I do not enjoy it. I try to pawn it off to my employees now, but when you start, you got to do it yourself. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so you hate it, but you still did it. Thank you for saying that because other people need to hear that. Oh, okay. yeah. Like, I may sound, uh, my voice, I don't know, in my head it sounds baritone a bit. Uh, I may sound confident, but I am, I like need to re energize. I totally empathize with the introverted lifestyle. So, this is not fun. Um, if I may, sorry, I just interjected there. Mm -hmm. uh, one easy way to kind of get around it is just go to a conference set. 
you don't need to like get them on the phone, but if you're meeting somebody in your industry and you be like, Hey man, I'm thinking about this. People will give you feedback. will give you their thoughts. And because it's an open setting, you have a few minutes and you can balance and you don't have to feel bad about how do I get off on the phone or something. So that, that's my hack there for customer feedback. Hack. So, so wait, if you're an introvert, you mm-hmm. just said you would rather walk up to people at a conference than not, or you already engage in conversation and therefore that makes it better. I think it's because you have the mindset, I'm at a conference, I need to talk to people, there's alcohol possibly, you're at a cocktail, there we go. you have food, so you can always be like, oh, that looks delicious, and you talk about whatever, and you're like, oh, I want more hors d'oeuvres, and there's a four minute company, it gives an easy out, right? With your phone call, you're kind of like, how long do we go, do we ramble on, how do I close it up? Whereas on conference or, or event, people are there to meet other people, so they're even more open to helping you out, uh, whereas in the phone call, people aren't uh, as much. So that's why I prefer I can psych myself up, do it for an hour or two and be like, Phew, I've got all the data I need. Let's get the hell out. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise people also like your heart starts beating as soon as you start doing the phone calls exactly. and stuff. And you're like, <gasps> and then you sound like an idiot at the beginning. Yeah. No, I, I used to have to be cold calls all the time. Sucks. Okay. So, so going back to the niche thing too, because I think this is really, really important. It's easy for somebody on the outside to see. And I tell people all the time to go smaller they yes. don't like that, like you said. So, so, um, so help me with the objection that I get all the time, which is how do I pick it? How do I know what what that niche that will work better is? So that, right. that piece. Or I'm afraid later I won't be able to expand more. I would much rather go more broad. Uh, so uh, let's tackle the second one. That's just ridiculous. Like I hate to be rude like that. Like sometimes you just need to be honest. You're like, that's, that makes Slap no sense. people around. You look at uh, something like Apple, who's making computers, and now they make phones, and their latest hit is earphones. You look at Microsoft, and they're originally making, uh, well, even MS-DOS is a whole different story, talking about, like, nerdness, but now they have hardware, they've got all this kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. No one cares. You can always re-bra- rebrand. Uh, I had a, a buddy, I have many bo- uh, friends of mine, actually, that took one brand name, did very well, but then changed their brand name because they wanted to expand. So... There's nothing holding you back other than this weird sense that you can't expand once you've uh, started. Um, in terms of like, how do you pick a niche? I'm a big fan of solving my own problem. I am the niche. So in the case of examine.com and supplementation, I was the niche of I've lost weight. Wait a minute, I don't trust supplements. Or wait a minute, I want to learn more about supplements in this very specific bodybuilding scene. Like, does creatine actually work? You may have heard of creatine, especially people who've been around for a while. Mark McGuire kind of got quote unquote busted for a decade. Oh, it's been a while. Uh, a while ago. And I always thought creatine was a steroid or it was some kind of like really nasty thing when really it's just something found in meat and they've extracted it. So um, I wouldn't, I, I, this is where you talk to the customers, but I would honestly just be like, I am the niche. I will find like-minded individuals um, and expand from that. Uh, in terms of the other kind of related thing I've heard is like, oh, I don't know if there's a lot of money. Listen, e-commerce in retail, sorry, e-commerce in the United States of America was roughly $400 billion in 2016. All right. You don't need even 0.0001% of that to be making bank. So, I'm sure you can niche it down. And again, this is retail e-commerce. It's not services, it's not consulting. God knows how much money is being made online. So uh, there's a lot of money out there on the internet. And this is, again, just the U.S. only. We're not talking about Canada, U.K., Australia, or anything. You can find money in whatever niche you decide to go after. So if we're solving that one niche, so let's say I think I know what my, well, I know what my problem is, and I think I know mm-hmm. what the niches that I want to pick, and I'm going to go talk to other people that are like-minded, right? 100%. How do we... How do you find those? Like, especially if it's something that's a super slice right. subset of what it is, right? So, so I like uh, only this type of whatever it is. Okay. So uh, the initial is obviously your friends, related events. Um, one underrated spot is meetup.com. Meetup has a meetup for any kind of imaginable thing you can pick. You'll find like-minded individuals in that area. The other interesting one, and this is one of my favorite examples, is you can spend just a little bit of money in finding out. So there's a company called Kettle and Fire. They are a bone broth company. Uh, and I think they're mid-seven if they haven't already hit eight figures. They're in Whole Foods and Kroger's, blah, blah, blah. But how do they start? Justin Maris was like, hmm, I like bone broth. I think other people would like it too. He spent 50 bucks on ads on Bing. He Wait, made Justin, this- Justin Maris? Maris, oh, yeah. I know him. Okay, great. I didn't even know. This is his story, right? So he spent 50 bucks on ads for Bing. 
uh, he, he's attraction all that, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know, he bought ads to the simple landing page that said, hey, we've got this fresh bone broth. Would you, uh, you know, 50 bucks or 30 bucks, whatever it was. And that was all he did. So he spent 50 bucks. He generated like 500 bucks in sales. He had no product ready. All in, in the, the page wasn't beautiful at all. It was just like, hey, this is what I'm selling. Would you like to buy? You click yes. It just straight go to PayPal. You put in PayPal, your PayPal information. That was it. There was no credit card. There was nothing. And I think he generated like 500 bucks in sales or something like that. And he emailed all of his customers back and said, hey, listen, we're out of stock, aka we've never actually made any stock. Um, it'll be two to three months before we're ready. And you know we'll give you a 50% discount or we can give you a refund right now. And like half the customers took the 50% discount. So even off of his original ad spend, if he generated 500 bucks, he still ended up with 250 bucks spending only 50 bucks. So you can test out in that way. Uh, the other one that's very underrated is Google surveys. So especially if you go to YouTube, you'll see like those uh, FAQ kind of style or Q&A kind of um, ads that you have to fill out. So Google survey will let you do a leading question and then a follow-up series of questions. So it's another easy way where it could be, let's say you're looking for bone broth, right? Like, are you interested in bone broth? If they say no, who cares, move on. If they say yes, then you go, do you care if it's fresh? Do you care if it's been pre-frozen? Do you care, what do you care about? Do you care about sodium, blah, 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 done. Now you gotta spend like 50 bucks. Um, and for entrepreneurs, like there's, there's two sides, uh, sides of it. I am not of the burn your bridges side. Do your side hustle, spend five hours a week, 10 hours a week on the side, build it up and then dive into it. So spending 50 bucks on this simple kind of ad or survey, which anyone can figure out, you can spend that much money while you have your job, while you're figuring it out. And that'll kind of help you figure out what your niche can really, really be about. Awesome. Because I knew Justin when he was doing a total different product. So apparently that one did not. Oh, last time I chatted with him it was a long time ago. Oh, some that, things work, some oh, things oh, don't. <laughs> but and, and Kettle on Fire has blown up for them. It was, I mean, they were uh, they just sponsored uh, uh, Tim's podcast and whatnot. It's done really, really, really well. Well, and what's it's, crazy is that that, sis, that that system that you just talked about was in the four hour work week years and years and years and years ago. And you're still saying that it's still relevant today, which is really impressive. Absolutely. 100%. So what most people will come back, though, is they'll go, well, I don't know how to do ads and I don't know how to do Google surveys and blah, 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 right? So, so Google, uh, let, me, let me just, Google survey is so easy. If you cannot figure out Google surveys, like you need to go off the internet, like the internet is not your place. You don't have to create anything. You literally just fill out your questions and your answers. That's it. Um, in terms of the other part, you know, I don't know how to do this. I will admit that it can be a little bit confusing but you're not hitting it out of the park, right? You're not trying to make it the best ever. You just sign up with something like leadpages.net, which lets you just put a little bit of text and a button. The button, they'll let you add the PayPal button. That's like two, three, four, maybe five hours of figuring it out. Same thing with big ads. Maybe it's not the easiest thing in the world, but what's the premise? You are spending a little bit of money. You want to target a keyword that someone might be searching, send it to that page you made through lead pages. So I understand that, but and this is where my chromogeny side comes out. In 1999, we didn't even have WordPress. We were working with Perl and CGI bin and, and permissions and that kind of stuff. I programmed my own blog, okay? So like using Nucleus yeah. and crap so, like that, people. <laughs> you can, uh, when I yeah, when I started, there was no PayPal. At least in Canada, there was no PayPal. We had to do merchant accounts and all that kind of stuff. So you can figure it out. I have faith in your intelligence and your uh, will to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> go with that. That was good. Good. Good job. I'll pat you on the back for that one. Okay. So, so as, as we're going through, so let's say they have a company. It's mm -hmm. starting to, to do well. There are maybe two employees ish, right? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to grow, but they also are not good at this yet because they're sort of brand new, right? right? I don't know what segment you can pick an example if you want. What, how yeah. do we manage resources, right? So how do we go, oh, I need to care a lot about sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. There's only two of us. And we need systems and we need to start a growth path, but we don't know what we don't know and we're not necessarily very good. What would you do if you were them? And feel free to pick a company. Yeah, so I am, I've always bootstrapped. Uh, I mean, I've written op-eds in like uh, newspapers or whatever about why I don't take VC money. I've had a lot of VCs come after me. Um, I am of the viewpoint this is, I'm sorry, that sounded very good. I know. I saw, no, no, it sounded good. It sounded like you were like running away and they're like chasing it's, you. That's, oh, man. <laughs> 
so many. <laughs> like literally just like, especially now with private equity coming up. Oh my God, we're just like slapping them away. But uh, I'm a very, I am oriented towards slow growth. I am, maybe it's that immigrant me- mentality, but I am not, let's say, I'm a bit risk averse. So for me, it's more develop the product um, and take existing customers and what can we sell to them further. So my growth, if I was in that position, would be more towards generating new products for our customers and ensuring that those products are hitting their um, desires. Um, In a very simplistic way, if you have a high-end model of anything you're making, if over 20% of your customers are buying it, it may be time to develop something even more high-end. So that's kind of my POV POV on it. Um, I can understand being more aggressive, I think strategic documents are important. I think they never, ever, ever pan out, especially if you do like a three-year document. Like past 18 months, it's almost you're just throwing things, at, uh, you know, darts at a blank wall. But I think it's important because taking that moment of like hindsight and, and reflection will force you to figure out what's important to you depending on your business. Um, and then you'll be able to allocate resources a bit more intelligently or a bit more in line with what your goals are because people um especially in entrepreneurship you always have fires going on there's always something happening right now we have we've just launched our first product in over three years for example.com and the team is running around but it's important as a leader for you to be able to step away from it um and set aside time and be like what's important to us where are we going to grow um and in a relevant uh or tangential but relevant to this i always set aside at least three four hours a week for reading which is there's no internet i have no laptop open and i'm just reading um and i find that super important because it gives me that downtime to figure out what's important to me what's important to my business and how do we approach it best interesting okay so the on the reading side of things that's consuming content though you think it gives you the downtime to start strategizing or output Sorry, when I say reading, uh, I meant more like I block aside time to read and act or or, or do something with it, right? Because we read stuff all the time, but we just read it and that's it, right? You read it, like, oh my God, this is genius. Yeah, I should totally use the word imagine when talking to my customers because it puts them into the mindset of visualizing stuff and move on to the next. Oh my God, that's also brilliant. So when I say reading, sorry, I meant was like read a couple of things. But start, I like, I love paper and pen. Start writing things down on how you're going to implement them. Start actually putting them into a to-do list or Asana or Trello, whatever you're using. So you actually have the time to uh, mull it over and make it happen. Uh, I think there's a reason, especially today, that we have the phrase shower thoughts because there's so few times left that we, that we are not digitally, you know, being stimulated being on the throne is no longer a moment of peace anymore. Now you got your phone or your laptop or whatever. And I'm not saying I'm above it myself. I am not saying that at all. Your laptop, wow. But, <laughs> but hey, man, sports articles are long. But it lets you, uh, you know, have that moment. Even the, like 10 seconds of peace will make your brain go so much further um, if you can put aside the time. Not if, you have to put aside the time. As a leader, no matter what, unless the house is literally on fire, you have to put that time aside. See, one of the things I give clients is aqua notes because they're shower notepads. So you can yeah, always right. have. Absolutely. They're they're so amazing. Amazing. Oh my God. Yeah, I totally screwed and up I, that part. And I will plan on taking a shower when I need to actually strategize. So that way. <laughs> yeah, not that advanced. That's pretty genius. Actually, I like that idea. I'm that. <laughs> so, but, but so <laughs> I have children. I have to come up with different <laughs> hacks, <laughs> quote enough, unquote, right? Enough. Leave me alone. Uh, but, but that's sort of my, that's actually where I was going to go with it when you were talking about how do we actually take the time to get on top of everything instead of having everything sort of be thrown at you all the time. So, and, and to me, you talk about output a lot too, instead of yeah. con- consumption, right? Input yeah. output is extremely important. How, how do you pay more attention to output? So uh, just to slightly rewind back on input, mm-hmm. um, my phone has no social media on it. Uh, other than WhatsApp, if you want to consider that to be social media, I don't have Facebook, I don't have Twitter, I don't have anything on it. Like my home screen is not even filled. I don't do apps on the phone, basically. I've got the tiny iPhone SE, it's a four-inch screen, drives me crazy, I don't want to use it. And so what I've done in terms of input to create output is, for example, my Facebook is, a guy have three screens, um, and I have Chrome on one side, I have Firefox on one, and I have Internet Explorer on the other. Just this is how I oh, operate. Okay. And only uh, Chrome has Firefox on it. So if I close Chrome, uh, sorry, 
I apologize. Okay. Only Chrome has Facebook logged oh, into it. So if okay. I close Chrome, Facebook no longer exists. So if I'm working on Firefox and I'm writing and I close Chrome, it's gone. I like even if I go to Facebook.com, it's not going to be logged in, so I'm not going to see anything. So the other part of that too is as you get more experience, you realize fires are not really fires, right? You also realize that if your employees can't get a hold of you, they tend to be able to figure it out on their own. Is even if you have a couple, especially if you're giving them the authority to, um, they will make it happen. They might they might freak out the first few times and like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. Where's the boss? And then they're like, okay, I can do this. If the boss not available, I have to step up. So that is how I've set it up so that output is easier for me. Now, in terms of output, uh, I am very prodigious in writing down everything. So I always carry around notebooks with me. Uh, if I'm walking and I have a thought, I walk a lot. That's my other way of disconnecting. Um, if I'm walking, I use the voice recorder app all the time. So in any given week, I will take anywhere from five to 30 random notes of things that pop up in my head. Um, so like I'll be walking and I'll see an interaction. So today, for example, I saw this, um, car had parked into an alleyway and was kind of blocking in this other car came in and he was just losing his mind with a, a honking. Right. And they were opening the door slowly. And I'm like, yeah, why is that guy being so slow? Because it was a really, really old man getting out of it. And the guy was mm -hmm. honking. Right. Mm -hmm. but, and, and I was thinking in my mind, I'm like, oh, you who was honking so hardly, I bet you're embarrassed now. And then he just kept on honking. And so it was like a story can be about like oblivious. The story can be about like, don't be so reactive. Give it 10 seconds and you realize maybe that's why it was, they were taking so slow. So um, I'm always recording this stuff into a notebook or into a voice recorder. Um, and then you use something like rev.com to transcribe anything you uh, say. So um, uh, that is then in text and then I can manipulate it around however um, I want. So that's kind of how I set up my output is by limiting my inputs in the first place. Okay, I love that. Another deeper question on this. What do you do? So I do voice recording too. Do you use the regular voice recording app on? Yeah, okay. I just use the regular one. I'm sure there are more advanced ones, but this is part of my ethos of staying away from apps mm -hmm. um, is that I don't have to, it gets a, I have my process, right? I record it, I download it, I throw it in a rev.com, they transcribe it for me, voila, I've got it all in front of me. Um, I'm sure there are apps that transcribe and whatnot, uh, but going back to my laziness, and then the other thing is like if you're using another app, you sign up, they've got your email address, are they going to email you, they're not going to email you. Um, I just try to keep it as simple, stupid as, you know, worldly possible. Where do you put, so so Rev.com, awesome, a lot of people recommend <laughs> that, we've used them before. Yeah. Um, and written notes, do you take yeah. pictures and send that? I, that's what I do for my assistant. So, I take pictures it, and I send it to him, but what, then where do you put it? Like tell me the so whole process. I like, so I have a few um, documents of like, Thoughts. So I have a major document on in Evernote that's like things to write about. And then as I start writing about them, I stick them into Grammarly and create its own document there. And I just kind of start running through it. So I my actual notebook to uh, the digital world, I manually do it because I find there's there's done a lot of research done about like how uh, working in different mediums works your brains in different ways, and so I find the act of writing from the notebook into a digital document it does a, a world of difference in keeping my synapses these fired. Really right. interesting. Yes. I have other people do it because I'm and then they can't read my handwriting because my handwriting is horrible. There's but also, <laughs> I like half the time I can't read my own handwriting, and, and it's one of those things that 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 that's what you got there. So <laughs> it's one of those things that you have to do it immediately. And I love crossing it out. It's so satisfying. Me too. You have to do it, I find you have to do it in like 48 hours or maybe 72 hours because you start kind of losing a bit of the context. You look back, like I hate it when I'm just looking at it. I'm like rubbing my head and I'm like, dude, what that? Like past Saul, what's wrong with you? Why, yes. why did you make future Saul struggle so hard? Okay, so that's my better. exact question because that's, so th I have these, which aren't necessarily, oh, this one's, oh, this one's not empty. Okay. But, but I write so much down because I am obsessed with paper and I have a weirdo system, but it doesn't, this one is not as effective as I would like it to be because so, it's huge, number one, and it's yes. not a 48 hour thing. Yes. Yeah. I always use notebooks. Um, <laughs> and I try, it's like at most every Friday, basically, I don't, I mean, I work on Fridays, but I don't really work on Fridays is when I meet people, Friday is when I read, Friday is when I write, and Friday is when I deal with this. So I know every Friday that at most, I guess, will be six days old, but I don't really do anything on Saturdays and Sundays. So it'll be like four days old. 
So it's still fresh in my mind. Okay. And I always like have like a major. So uh, oftentimes it'll be like if I was talking to somebody. So I was talking to Daniel right here and this is Daniel. So that will help jog my memory of what the hell was I thinking about. Um, and so that that's kind of my way. It's like I make sure it doesn't stick around too long in my head. It's going to be put into some kind of um, digital format. Yes. And you've probably come to this process over a lot because I was carrying oh, that big book for a long time. We just created our own eventual millionaire ones that are because everything has lines on it. And I hate lines. Right. Because I draw Fair stuff. Enough. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we created our own, but it's it's a ever evolving process of what I actually like versus what I don't. It's annoying. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I like the small ones just because they fit into my pocket so easily that I don't have to lug anything around. Um, you know, females may have a slight advantage I'm a lady. versus yeah. they, can take, they can take larger ones. I don't have a giant. Um, what, are, what are giant bags called again? Um, handbags. I don't even know. I don't have any. any. I have a laptop any. bag. Is that bad? <laughs> That's all I use. <laughs> I love I love that we're talking about the nuances of whether you have pockets or whether you have a purse or whether you have one. It's super important. It's super important, especially because it gets folded when it's your pocket. Like you can see, this is kind of not straight and it gets folded. So you always want to put it in the same direction. Otherwise, it becomes like weird. Anyway, yeah, we can get into that. We talk real about the best, most important things in life at this podcast. I love it. Awesome. Yeah. I know. And I, I literally could probably go way, way too deep uh, into things. I want to start wrapping up. Before I ask the last question I always ask, though, I want to ask uh, a productivity, not, I'm not going to call it a hack. I'm going to say, what is your best productivity tip? Because everybody has no time, supposedly, right. even though time's a creative thing and all that fun stuff. But <laughs> but give us just one, just one thing. I found that the personally, and including me, and I, and I wasn't like this originally. It was forced almost on me by other people. The most productive people in general, obviously, there's always caveats, that I know have an organized calendar. Um, number one thing, I have friends who don't use a calendar and it blows my mind. Um, if you're in a relationship and he or she's doing something, they've got their own stuff, you've got your own stuff. Calendar is how you know if they're busy, if they're available. Calendar is how you know when you've got this happening or that happening. So uh, that is by far my number, number one recommendation is put everything in your calendar and not just like meetings, but writing, uh, work, all that kind of stuff. So like I talked, I mentioned that we had our first product launch in three years. So I've set aside an hour today earlier. It was in my calendar of email um, VIPs with a copy of our fitness guide, which is what we launched, right? So I emailed them and I was like, hey, this is what we launched. Um, and I knew I had an hour. So I knew I had set aside time. So I wasn't rushed. And I wasn't. And the one nice thing is when you know this is what you're doing, you're not being distracted by what incoming emails are coming or whatever. And, and I'm kind of cheating here. And I would add this to the second thing. Yes. Disable notifications. Like, don't have your Facebook open. Don't have those, uh, you know, like Twitter, Facebook, all these other ones uh, let you do uh, in-browser notifications now. Disable all that kind of stuff. If you're using Slack, which is fine, disable Slack notifications or turn them off or put it to away. That is so big for your mental relief of not being distracted. And so the calendar gives you focus and lack of notifications helps you focus on everything else. And everybody do that right now, especially delete social media off your phone. So how do you, I have a follow-up. I know I said I didn't, but I totally do. So on Fridays, when you're like, this is the this day, how do you actually hold yourself accountable to that? Because sometimes it's like, oh, and then this popped up and it's another thing on Friday or it's a this or it's a that. How do you make sure that what happens on Friday stays on Friday? So uh, a couple of things. One, my team knows, leave me alone on Fridays. Uh, secondly, I do my weekly team meetings on Friday. So like I know on Friday, I'll work out at 12 o'clock because of my team meeting at two o'clock, which will go to let's say three o'clock. So I've got that time blocked away. Um, subsequently, people want to meet and talk all the time. And I push everybody on Friday. Like, I'm like, listen, I just don't do, like, unless you're flying into town, maybe then, yeah, okay, that's an exception. But in general, I'm always like, Friday, Friday, Friday. So my Fridays almost naturally fill up in that way. Mm. So I might have like a 30 minute break between two people. And I, I, like, I basically push all my reading to Friday. So I'm excited to read. I'm, in terms of like my priorities in my head, I'm like, okay, I could answer this email, but it won't matter. I'm very big on like, will it matter? And will it matter if I respond today versus on Tuesday? No, it won't. So why not read this interesting article that I've been waiting for? And as an example of an interesting article, I'm not even talking about business stuff. I read a fascinating article on BuzzFeed of all the places about how the Titanic, aka the movie, got made. And 
the story was basically like James Cannon was obsessed over the smallest details. Like he, he had uh, Titanic experts come in and they couldn't find anything wrong with this entire recreation. And then so the question internally, and, and this is kind of how it parlayed. And I'd also recently read about how The Wire was originally not something HP wanted to work with, but they were so meticulous with all the details. And part of what made The Wire so amazing was all this attention to detail, right? Um, and so that became a lesson to my team being like, hey, listen, these details matter. No one notices. But any major hit you'll notice has got these precise details. For Apple, for how much we love to make fun of them, in general, they're very, very detail-oriented. So there is a real-life example of an article that I was excited to read that had nothing to do with my business, but there's always lessons you can uh, delve from it. And that's kind of how it keeps me focused. From like, that's a big thing to tell the team, we need to stay focused. And it's not just, we need to stay focused, we need to be perfect. It's like, here's a real life example, here's another real life example. Everyone loves either The Wire or The Titanic. It's like, if you love The Titanic, man, I like The Wire, but that's okay, and vice versa, right? Um, so that's kind of how I keep it ship shape. And you saved that article that you wanted to read and then yeah, planned on reading it on Friday? I have an Evernote document and I just uh, fill it with what I want to read. People use uh, Pockets, another one. Uh, there's a few other ones, but again, with my non-app point of view, I just stick everything in Evernote um, and it's all there for me to read whenever I need to to read it. Uh, that's good. So you don't get distracted during the regular part of the week because yeah. exactly. that happens. Everything's pushed away. Like I, I do have a bad propensity to keep tabs open, but I have a pretty decent job at taking anything I want to read. I'll take at least four to five minutes and throwing into Evernote. I'm like, I'm going to read it, throw it in there. I'm going to read it, I'm going to throw it in there. Done. Okay. And that way, 30 minutes is not a big deal on Friday. Because I was going, it, how do you read if you've, you are an yeah. important person. So I'm sure networking fills up really, really quick on your Friday. Yes. So I was going, when do you actually read in the little teeny yes. subsect? Okay. Which makes sense. All right. Or actually, you know what? Honestly, it depends on my mood. I will set aside like two hours and be like, I'm just going to read. Uh, and it might even just be a book. I, honestly, like it will be like, ah, you know what? I don't feel like straining my brain. I'm going to read a fantasy book. Inevitably, what's going to happen is the more, the deeper you get into this, and especially I think good entrepreneurship part of it is, is storytelling, finding meaning from something like uh, allegories, metaphors, similes. They're huge, I think, in being a good leader, being a good entrepreneur. Inevitably, anything you read, you can turn it or twist it or however you want to say it, convert it into something that's applicable, into life, into business or productivity, all that jazz. Which makes perfect sense for you writing your blog. So that way it's not just the same recycle stuff of the five tips of the things. Exactly. Okay. So you get your inspiration that way. Okay. I love it. I'll ask about your fiction book offline because I want I have questions on that because you're a geek. So I'm sure, I'm sure our tastes will be similar. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So I have to ask the last question, even though I totally asked 17 other ones just for free. No problem. Right. <laughs> What's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Okay. So. Uh, this is going to be a little bit nebulous and people might hear this and they might shake their head. And I promise you, this will reap benefits. You cannot even possibly imagine. Um, one of the best habits I've developed for myself is anytime I come across anything interesting, I send a note to the writer and I thank them. And I will often try to like raise another issue they may not have thought of. That's it. And the reason this is super important is everyone talks about network um, and this is going to sound egotistical, but people come to me. So I did a, uh, I do these charity food offs and I did the first one less than a year ago in 2017, January, we raised 1400 Canadian dollars. Huge. Well, huge relative. Uh, same number of tickets. I did one in New York two months ago and we raised over $30,000, uh, dollars there. And you know, there was X superstar and Y superstar and I'm not going to name drop because it's just too go gauche, but People, I had all these people email me or message me. I'm having like 50 plus being like, oh, how did you get X person there? And how did you get Y person there? And they think like I'm some kind of like, other people are like this networking genius or whatever. No, it was never about that. It was I've done the work. And if I come across something nice, if I genuinely email them and say, hey, I like this stuff, no matter how famous you are, like I know Mark Manson, right? He had the number one uh, uh, nonfiction selling book uh, of 2017. Number one on Amazon. That's not a small number. Um, even he, relative to how much angry emails he gets, does not get that many people saying, hey, I like your stuff. And not just not just say, I like your stuff, but build on it. Build on, hey, and, and to show that you actually read it. Don't just be like, hey, I like your stuff. Like, for example, 
back to the BuzzFeed Titanic article. I wouldn't just email and be like, hey, man, I really liked your article. I'd be like, hey, I really liked it. I thought the part about how obsessed Cameron to de- uh, was with detail was very fascinating. The wire was similar, and I've now applied the same ethos. I use this story as an example to my own employees to be like, hey, this is important. So you, you're not just like trying to suck up to them. You're showing you're a real human being. Um, and I'll say that as the recipient now of like nonstop people trying to be my friends or whatever. And I'm not, I swear I'm not trying to be egotistical about this. You identify who you want to respond to. And there's people who aren't, haven't just read your story and like know that you like cookies or whatever, make it an oddball reference, but they've actually read what you've written and they'll respond. And the beauty and tying this all back up is, and I'm not big on quotes, but Steve Jobs had a quote where he doesn't know how the dots will connect, but they'll eventually connect something like that. I've totally butchered it. But the point is, you don't know how this network of yours will eventually help. And network is super, super powerful. It will unlock everything. Um, remember, uh, you, I'm sure you remember this, but people don't know. Uh, I post on Facebook being like, Ugh, anyone that's got the word millionaire in their brand, I want nothing to do with it. Everyone agreed, but I had like a dozen plus people being like exception. And you know who the exception is, obviously. Because I'm right. But that's that. But that's the point, right? That speaks so much volume on how much networking can happen, where people will vouch for you without even. And half the people didn't tag you. They didn't say anything about. They didn't like you. Wouldn't have known. They just said it because they had to say it, right? Because they're like, oh, wait a minute. I agree with you. There's an exception. So that and was that right gave number. me chills because because to have somebody that's a big deal because you're a big deal say yeah. that it's a, a bad thing, and I was like, well, aw, right? And then I had a bazillion friends go, but wait, except for Jamie, and that yeah, is exactly. like. Uh, uh. so powerful and like beyond even me anyone who's reading the threads maybe like god knows how many people read the, uh, the comments they'd be like wait a minute i gotta check out this person right without you necessarily having to pitch anything them have to even to say you need to read this person so it goes back to that one actionable thing is like if you show appreciation for output that someone's generating it could be a video it could be a news piece it could be someone local admittedly if someone's like oprah she might not be able to get to it maybe we need to aim a little bit lower but any writer, journalist, anyone who's written anything of interest, 100% actionable, super easy, takes all the five minutes, say thank you. And don't say thank you, like show that you actually read their stuff or listen or whatever, and you will build friends all over the, all over the world, all over. Please, everybody that's listening, actually do this, even if it's just once so you can see, because it's super easy. One of the reasons why I did what you're exact saying, because I lived in the middle of nowhere in Maine, I had no friends. So I was like, hey, you're amazing. Will you be my friend? <laughs> yeah. And it appeals to your introversion, right? If And by you, obviously, I mean in a generic way. If you feel uncomfortable or if you feel awkward, you can write this email quickly. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece, but you can write this email. It goes in the void. Some people don't answer because they didn't get it. Their, their EA got it or they don't care, that's fine, who cares? But the ones that will respond, will respond so positively that you've now basically made a, a friend right there. I love this. Everybody take five minutes, go do it right now, or put it in your calendar for later, for when you get to do it for later. Absolutely. See? I actually have a time to like show appreciation, but that's like other, like you start, you know, setting aside time. I, uh, there's nothing nicer than someone randomly emailing you, like someone that you know, and be like, hey man, I just think you're really cool. And you're like, this is awesome. I will take this. There's no expectation, no ask, no nothing. It's just like, hey, I was thinking about you and I think you're pretty cool. Or I read something you wrote and I like this. Done. You're like, thank you. I will take that. <laughs> it made my day. I love you already, which is interesting because we've never actually met. But everybody, yeah. make sure you check out his site. Tell us more about where we can find you, even though apparently you have no social media presence on your phone. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my website is sjo.com. It is not my initials as most people think it is. Uh, it's just where I talk about like entrepreneurship and productivity and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I don't have a fan page. I just have my own Facebook profile page. I will say uh, ever so occasionally I will say something of that uh, it warrants merit. But in general, I just uh, pontificate endlessly because it's my Facebook profile. I can do whatever I want. Uh, but those are the best ways to get a hold of me. I'm pretty responsive. Uh, via email or Twitter or Facebook, uh, but I do have a, a large inflow, so I may be slightly delayed in responding. But otherwise, I love love having conversations with people. Well, and I love I love your stuff because you can tell you care, and what you put out there matter. Even if it's just your your thought, like it really comes across. Just so you know. Thank you. I I highly recommend this. I keep rambling, right? I highly recommend to everybody, even if you're not an entrepreneur, to put your thoughts out there. It could be on Facebook, it could be on Medium, it could be on something really professional. 
but there's something incredibly uh, powerful of trying to say, take the, the jangled mess of thoughts in your brain, trying to give it some level of coherence and putting it out there. Just by having, you know, it's like how you become uh, better when you teach, right? If you can teach it to a fifth grader or whatever, that's one of the rules. It's the same thing. If you can put it together in a organized fashion, hugely great for your brain. All right, I'm done. I apologize. I just keep- No, I actually really, really appreciate that last little piece a lot because I don't put enough out there. I I talk all the time to people and clients and I definitely don't put enough out there on purpose. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I know it took a long time to get you on, but I so appreciate knowing and seeing face to face and hopefully you'll come back on the show again sometime. Maybe if you're lucky. We'll <laughs> He's a big deal. Did you not get that? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> Look, this, you're like, that's how I end it. <laughs> Perfect. No, he's awesome. Okay. Well, good. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming on, Saul. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the Eventual Millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus, you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new Start Here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you and have a fantastic day. Bye.